This is going to be taking a look at the following questions. Um, and you know, maybe more some more questions will be focused in on than others. But the questions are evaluate the extent to which immigration affected United States culture. So we're gonna look at immigration patterns. Um, evaluate the extent to which industrialization affected the United States from 1815 to 1860. So we'll take a look at industrialization. And then another way of looking at this is evaluate the extent to which new technologies caused the market revolution from 1800 to 1848. And the last one is um, the transportation innovation. Um, so evaluate the extent to which transportation innovation contributed to American national unity in the period 1800 to 1860. In this chapter, we're really going to be looking at uh, big ideas, big, um, you know, big things like, you know, immigration patterns and um, transportation changes that are taking place in, in the country. And those kinds of things um, are less about events than they are about like demographics and ideas and concepts. So I thought it would um, lend itself well to kind of talking about it more broadly. And I think we'll start to see some connections, not just to like within the time period, but also connections outside of that time period to help you kind of think about how this all fits within a context of all of American history. Because these are big trends. Immigration patterns are a big trend. Industrialization um, is a big trend. Um, the idea of innovation and transportation is a big trend that we could be taking a look at through all American history. So I'll take a moment to kind of pause and talk about the bigger picture as we go through this. This is a quote from Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it says, the progress of invention is really a threat to monarchy. Whenever I see a railroad, I look for a republic. So think about, you know, what is that, what exactly does that mean? I think what Emerson is trying to say is that invention leads to the destruction of autocratic regimes, whether they be monarchies or dictatorships, and that when you come up with new business ideas or new in innovations, it usually shows you that there is freedom. And one of the things that you could take a look at is economic freedom, leading to democratic freedom kind of being interlinked with one another. And if you were to take this to today, I wonder what you would put in. Um, you can, you know, substitute, you know, dictatorship for monarchy and substitute maybe the internet for the railroad. That the, And so the sentence would be the progress of invention is a threat to dictatorship. Whenever I see the internet, a free and open internet, I look for a republic. So uh, the idea that a government... Um, and that has innovation that allows for economic um, freedom could also mean that there's um, this idea of free ideas being exchanged. So that's really the importance here that like you may think, well, what does it matter that all these transportation innovations that are happening in the period like the, the road or the canal system or eventually the railroad, what impact does that have on uh, democracy? I think it has an immense impact um, on democracy and that the two may be linked together, in fact, that this kind of innovation doesn't necessarily happen outside of a democracy, or at least that's what Ralph Waldo Emerson thinks. So we're going to take a look at some big trends. We won't start off with um, technologies. We'll talk, talk about immigration patterns in the United States. So this is a chart that takes a look at immigration patterns from 1790 all the way to 1860. And you've got the blue represents white population. Uh, and then the non-white population, primarily in this period, that's um, black people and maybe Native Americans in there as well. And then it tells you a percentage of people that were non-white. So the percentage of people, it's basically a nice standard for the, roughly for black people in this period. And then the total population is off into the last column. So what's happening? You know, percentage wise, the country is getting less and less um, of a population of non-white people in the United States as time goes on. In the beginning, and it's about 19% of us are non-white. And then by 1860, about 14%. So what accounts for that? I mean, one thing that you're seeing among non-whites is that it's going up um, in its population. So it's not like they're 
like the black population isn't getting bigger in terms of its absolute value, but as its percentage, it's not. So that means that the white population is going up. Why is that? Well, the black population wouldn't go up because of new importation of slaves into the States after 1810, because the importation of slaves is outlawed by that period. But so that's not reason why. The only reason that you would see a, a greater percentage of non-white people in the United States would be because of the fact that there are people being born. So that's maybe a reason why there's more of a slowed growth. It's not a slowed growth because there's still, you know, in the beginning it's about just under a million people. And by the end, it's almost, you know, four and a half, it's four and a half million people in the United States. I think it could be classified at that time as non-white. So what accounts for this major, like exponentially bigger increase in the population of white people? It's not just the fact that there are people that are being, you know, reproducing, having new, having kids, and then therefore, yeah, you know, the population's increasing. It has more to do with immigration than anything else. So it's just interesting to note that even though that the non-white population got bigger, the immigration patterns of this period from all around the world kind of show a different story. And, you know, that doesn't show it in that one chart. But here we go and take a look at um, Irish and German immigration population uh, from 1830 to 1900. And you'll see that that's where people are coming from. Um, so this is what we call first wave immigration and the second wave immigration happens in the 1880s uh, and 90s. And we move from having Irish population and German population moving in to, um, people from Eastern Europe and, and, uh, and Italy as just one place. Like, so Eastern Europe and, and, um, and not like Western Europe per se, but like, but like, um, Southern Europe. And these populations are met with the similar kinds of um, disdain as the Irish and the Germans. So the Irish and the Germans come over to the United States in the 1830s and the 1840s in very large numbers. Um, the Irish coming primarily because of economic uh, and poverty in their own country. Um, and some people have categorized the potato famine that took place in Ireland as another example of a genocide by other means. And that's why they come over to the United States is because of that potato famine. And the Germans are coming for slightly different reasons. It's, you know, economic um, opportunities, but not um, out of a dire need to come to the United States. Just have a different reason for coming. So what I want us to take a look at and think about in this period is, you know, what exactly happens when the Irish and the German Americans are coming into the United States? You know, where are they settling? Where are the Irish going? Where are the Germans going? And then how do people in the United States treat those people? Um, and compare and contrast that to the way that immigrants are treated today in society. And what is their view about the patterns of immigration? So I'm going to show you some clips that I think might get a little bit at some of the overall trends that are happening among uh, immigration in the United States. This first one, um, I think I'm going to show you this one right here, which is an animated map shows the timeline of immigration in the period. Okay. So for here, you've got where they're coming from, the time period. And then down here is a timeline of events. And this is number of immigrants by decade in the millions. Like I said, that slave trade affected things and the population's gonna shift. So these are people coming um, from Europe, primarily the Irish and the Germans in this period. It doesn't separate them out by country. Then we do get immigrants in the 1840s, 1860s from Asia. That's that potato famine I was talking about. Thank you. 
Now we're in our second wave of immigrants. And Chinese laborers are actually excluded in 1882. We'll talk more about that as we go on. And why that took place. So this idea of America being this open country isn't mostly true. We have not really been that open. So people are coming from Eastern Europe. We go into this period between the war, 1920 and 1940s, so of World War One and, and just before World War Two, of isolation. We don't allow a lot of people into the country. We do take in people uh, after the war, World War Two, but not from everywhere. Remember, the Asian population is greatly reduced. But then by 18, 1965, that removes that restriction. And that's why the Asian population has grown um, a lot. Like they say in five years, quadrupled from 1965 on. That's the big pattern at the end, in the late 60s to 80s, is this Asian population coming into the United States. And Mexico. So the next piece I want us to take a look at is uh, another animated um, animation, but it's really taking a look. It has a point of view. I want you to understand that. But it's um, one that I think it's nice because it kind of gives a little bit of a commentary. It has a point of view. It's from Box. You guys are creating videos that are explainers, and this might kind of help you kind of think about how you do yours. I mean, of course, they do all kinds of things with After Effects that maybe you don't have access to. So I don't expect you to go this far. But... Um, yeah, it's just interesting to just look at the style of this video and the way they use maps. So the issue of who to let into this country and who not to let into this country is about as old as the country itself. It's an issue that America has debated since the early 19th century, and we've admitted people from nearly every single country since, but it hasn't really been an even uh, admission process. So this line represents 200,000 legal immigrants to the U.S., and we're going to stack them up to see uh, when they came to the U.S. and uh, where they came from. So early on, most were European, largely Irish, German, and British, and there were also Chinese and Canadian immigrants. But in 1882, the U.S. passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned Chinese immigration for 10 years. That was extended and then made permanent, and it wasn't repealed for 61 years. Uh, the economic depression of the 1890s decreased European immigration and nearly stopped Canadian immigration entirely. But after the Depression, the demographics of immigrants changed, and there was a rise in Russian, Italian, Spanish, and Japanese immigrants. In 1917, the U.S. banned immigration from Asian countries entirely, except for the Philippines and Japan. In 1921, the U.S. capped immigration based on nationality. This severely limited the ability to immigrate to the U.S. for people not from the Western Hemisphere, or a country with older roots in the U.S. Then the Great Depression happened. All immigration plummeted. Then World War II happened. The U.S. refused to increase immigration caps for 20,000 Jewish children fleeing Nazi rule. It also stopped naturalization proceedings for Italians, Germans, and Japanese. In 1952, the U.S. stopped excluding immigrants based on race, but more stringent quotas meant most slots were still for Western Europeans. In 1965, the quota system was entirely repealed. It allowed for a far more diverse group of immigrants, particularly from Central America and South America, but also Asia. In the 1970s and 80s, Asian immigrants arrived in huge numbers, largely from the Philippines, South Korea, India, and Hong Kong. The U.S. also evacuated 130,000 people from Vietnam after the war. 
In the 1990s, the U.S. increased immigration caps to 700,000 annually. The country began to invest in border security to discourage unauthorized immigration, but an exchange allowed nearly 1.7 million Mexican immigrants in the 1990s. Immigration to the U.S. is now more diverse than ever, but with the rise of ISIS and the Syrian refugee crisis, prominent politicians are again talking about which immigrant groups to restrict. If you want to see how people from a specific country came to the U.S., click here for the full interactive. So that's taking a look at it from the point of view of saying that the immigration policy that has been um, of the United States has always excluded people based on race. And that makes it, quote, according to the title of the article, racist. So that's I want you to just you know think about that um, in the certainly those that came in from Ireland and Germany uh, from this period were not treated well. Um, and the same eventually was true of the Italians and the Jewish population. Basically, it was uh, Italians were disliked because of, and the Irish as well, because of their being Catholic. Um, and the United States was at that time predominantly um, Protestant. And so it kind of viewed that with a lot of suspicion. They were always concerned that they were going to be controlled by the Pope as opposed to being able to um, subvert democracy in that way. And I think there was also a racist reason for not liking the Irish or the Germans. And a whole political party gets um, formulated in opposition to this immigrant population and they're called the know nothing party um and they're anti-immigration and this is a thing that we see constantly throughout american history where there's just a lot of suspicion of the immigration patterns that are happening in the united states and people claim at the time um in the 1820s 1840s that they're nativists um they're nativists because they were first born americans and that they are um you know, going against this idea of the population of the United States becoming much more um, diverse than it was before and believe it's diluting things. I think that's, um, if we could find elements of that um, in lots of different places um, and, and different groups that are anti-immigrant in the United States, and they certainly are still around. This um, puts a population understanding of like, as it is roughly today, uh, this is maybe a couple years old, but I think Generally, the, the statistics are accurate. Maybe in the next census, when we get that data back, they'll do a new video. But this is from Business Insider.
So we're going to take a look at the where the where the Germans are going into the United States, and we're going to see that as the Germans come into the United States, they're traveling out west, and that's partly because they just have the money to do it. So you don't really see a lot of Irish living uh, further into the Midwest of the United States, in part because they couldn't afford the travel um, out that far. So we get pockets of people or the Swiss born and uh, in, 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 in more in the Midwest. And this is just a depiction of one of those immigrants that came. This is a German immigrant experience. And I want you to think about how this, you know, compares and, and to the Irish experience. So a lot of people came over here who were all off in Germany, but were enticed to leave their fatherland by boastful and imprudent letters from their friends or children and thought they could become rich in America. This deceives a lot of people since what can they do here? If they stay in the city, they can only earn their bread at hard and unaccustomed labor. If they want to live in the country and don't have enough money to buy a piece of land that is cleared and has a house, then they have to settle in the wild bush and have to work very hard to clear the trees out of the way so they can sow and plant. But people who are healthy, strong, and hardworking do pretty well. So from the German experience in 1847, it's difficult for people to settle, but it's, you know, not an impossibility. This is Margaret McCarthy, a recent arrival <coughs> in America. So this is um, from an Irish perspective captured much of the complexity of the immigrant experience in a letter she wrote from New York to her family in Ireland in 1850. This is what she says. This is a good place and a good country, but there is one thing that's ruining this place. The immigrants have not enough to take money to take them to the interior of the country, like the Germans were able to, which obliges them to remain here in New York and the like places, which causes the less demand for labor and also the great reduction in wages. So they're like competing with one another. Um, but they're all like, in, like congregated into these cities on the East Coast, mostly New York for her at least. For this reason, I would advise no one come to America that would not have money after landing here that they would enable them to go West in case they would get no work to do here. So getting out West is, a, is obviously difficult for the Germans, but possible, almost impossible for the Irish. They just don't have the means to do it. <laughs> and here's a French traveler taking a look at the experience um, of uh, people in the United States at that time. I have seen the Indian in his forests and the Negro in his chains and thought as I contemplated their pitiable condition that I saw the very extreme of human wretchedness, but I did not then know the condition of unfortunate Ireland. So at least according to this observer, he felt the experience of slaves was better than that of those in Ireland. Um, might be debatable, but uh, according to this 19th century person, it at least underlines the fact that the Irish in Ireland had it uh, at a very difficult time. Um, by the 1850s or so, there was a mention in one of the videos that the steamer ships kind of started to come. And this is um, an example of that like starting to happen, looking at those um, signs and, and, and posters that were put up eventually. There will eventually be ones for steamer ships to help them get across to the United States. An interesting thing that happens uh, as people come to the United States, and this might be true for lots of different immigrant experiences, but here outlined is the Irish immigrant experience. They celebrated St. Patrick's Day with greater zeal than they did in Dublin, in Ireland itself. So uh, why is that? Like, Why are they you know, spending and, and, and asserting themselves uh, more powerfully in the United States? And could be for lots of reasons. Um, maybe it's the fact that they want to show off their 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 color <laughs> in a way. Uh, I mean, like the idea of being able to show off who they are and to kind of assert themselves and make awareness about them in a new land might be part of it as well. And holding on to those traditions. So it's not just for those people that are watching, but also for themselves to make sure they don't lose those traditions. I think lots of immigrant communities have this as well, where they celebrate things that are traditional to their country in a greater zeal in, in the United States than they would at home to keep on to their heritage and also to explain and um, explicate that heritage to the people around them at that, you know, in the United States itself. I did mention earlier that there was this growing uh, anti-foreignism um, that grew in the United States and it came from the Know Nothing Party. 
1856, this was their creed. Americans must rule America. And to this end, native born citizens should be selected for all state, federal, or municipal offices of government, employment, and preference to naturalized citizens. So a naturalized citizen would be an immigrant, a person who wasn't here naturally, but had to become naturalized and become a, a citizen of the United States, though they came from another country. Um, we could see a lot of this in the movie Gangs of New York. Um, there's a lot that they get wrong, but there's a lot that they do get right in this movie. So I'm trying to pick out some things because it really does depict this period nicely. Um, this movie actually takes place during the draft riots. Um, and one of the draft riots of the Civil War, and one of the major criticisms of the movie is that it seems to depict the 1840s better than it really does the time period that it's actually uh you know, putting forth. So I think that you get a real sense of what the 1840s, 1850s are like better from this movie than you do just before or during the Civil War. But this is um, the political machine that was there um, in the United States. And one of the things that they tried to do was to actually take the Irish and the German immigrants that were coming off and get them to be a part of the Democratic Party. And they did that by um, just kind of Roping them in, you'll see. I wonder if Miss Everdeen would angle her rifle in some other direction. So this is that's Boss Tweed. Um, he'll become a little more um, infamous a little bit later on in American history. But even though he doesn't exist in the 1840s in the same way that he does in this part, um, it just sort of shows the the idea of the political machine, the people with that aren't actually in power, but um, can control the Democratic Party within New York City, for example, like it is here, taking place here in Gangs of New York, um, that they're able to kind of make deals with the new immigrant community to get them to back those uh, political parties. I wonder, Mr. Ballon, if you understand the true value of this sort of publicity. The Archbishop himself, shoulder to shoulder with half the Irish in the fight for us. I'm offering my boy to form an alliance with you against Bill Cutting and his slate of nativist candidates. I'll negotiate a handsome fee for every Irish vote you send Tammany's way in the coming elections. I need a new friend in the five point sum. Tammany is where the, uh, where the government was, so that's of New York City. Just a moment, Mr. Tweed. Suppose we do get you those votes. Would you back an Irish candidate of my choosing? I don't think so. What if we get you all the Irish votes? Mr. Ballon, that will only happen in the reign of Queen Dick. <laughs> beg your pardon? That means it will never happen. Now, I might be persuaded <laughs> to back an Irish candidate to say, hold him. Hold him. We've already got Irish aldermen. So we have. That's why. Well, what's bigger than aldermen? Sheriff. Sheriff. Pardon, Mr. Tweed. You back an Irishman for sheriff of the city and county of New York, and we'll get him elected. I love the Irish son, but higher than aldermen, you shall never climb. Well, why not? For one thing, no man living can consolidate the Irish vote. I can't. And for another, I mean no fungery. No one's yet found an Irish candidate for sheriff worth voting for. Mom. Here. <laughs> Dad, me looking as sober as my own grandfather. Another great man, I'm sure. I thought a drunken bastard. Could I say what I want? That's what I wanted you. Our elected representatives are a gang of thieves who swear to better our lot while dipping their hands deep into our pockets. I stand shoulder to shoulder with community leaders like Bill Cutting against any and all inroads into our fine democracy. So that's anti-democrat uh, immigrant point of view there um, from the Know Nothing Party. We'll go back to that video. We'll get to that point. Better our lot while dipping their hands deep into our pockets. I stand shoulder to shoulder with community leaders like Bill Cutting 
against any and all inroads into our fine democracy that, that no one takes away what you have earned by pluck and application to invading hordes of Hibernians. You go to the polls and you put your mark next to the name Walter McGinn against the potato eaters like them over there. Seen in our job. Why should so many Irish stay down south when the first war to win is not down in Dixie, but right here in East Street? And who's the finest street fighter in the five points? That's right. You let the whole damn city hear it. That man was right born for this. He's killed 44 men, laid low a couple hundred more. Is that right? All right. You should have run him for mayor. All right, line him up. It's so this is um, Bill Cuddy, who's supposed to represent the Know Nothing point of view. And I know this takes place during the Civil War, but like this debate of Know Nothings uh, kind of highlights some of the ideas that are going on in the 1840s. Um, and actually the big criticism of this movie is that it depicts that time period best and really doesn't do the 1860s that great. Um, now what he's doing is very interesting. The, if ever, maybe you've heard the phrase, vote early and vote often. Uh, and the idea there is to say that it's about corruption with voting. So there, you know, there's a lot of fraud that does take place in a lot of these elections. And the reason for that is that there's no um, uh, Australian ballot. So an Australian ballot doesn't come until much later. Basically, you refer to that as the secret ballot, where you just vote and no one knows how you voted. When you voted in this period, you voted and, and the people saw you put your vote inside the box. They would know exactly which side uh, you were voting for. Not like today, you go behind um, a curtain or, or, or mail it in, where no one would really see it at all. The fraud that took place is that they would you know, have dead people voting. They would have people voting multiple times by just shaving parts of themselves. Um, so like you go in with a full beard and full head of hair and like slowly get rid of hair <laughs> to the point where um, you were able to continue to vote. Um, and it was all uh, in support of a political party. So the political parties went out and they actively did this. Election day! This great country of ours, even the hot feeds get the vote. That's our to more haste on. And where are you going? That's them shaving so they can vote multiple times. Twice. Twice. Only twice. You call that doing your civic duty? Come on, Nick. Oh, no, you don't. Get back and sit down. Here's a little one. Clean them up good. Shave their beards off, boys, and send them back to vote again. All right, boys. Vote North Tammany. Vote North Tammany. Two gentlemen of our great city need is a new cotton. Now, I propose it should be a modest economical structure. Excuse me one moment. Mouse already won by 3,000 more votes than there are voters. Uh, three, make it 20, 30. We don't need a victory, we need a Roman triumph. But we don't have any more ballots. Remember the first rule of politics. The ballots don't make the results. The counters make the results. The counters keep counting. <laughs> so uh, election fraud, for sure, taking place. Um, there's a lot of dispute about the, um, the Irish and the German Im immigrants' uh, impact on elections. Um, and the know-nothing point of view was that they were stealing elections. Um, in particular, they always espouse this belief. So here's an example of a political cartoon. And I like to kind of break down political cartoons into various quadrants, and I create A, B, C, D. If you look here, um, this item here is an Irish shillelagh. Um, and a shillelagh is just a stick that you beat people with. It's very strong. That's what that was supposed to be. And people at that time would have known that. And this is, so they're, they're, this is the Irish immigrant and the German immigrant. Um, we know that because this one says Irish whiskey and this one says lager and beer is spelled in the German way. And in the background, you've got the poll. So it's very similar to kind of what they saw here. Like you see, they're, they're distracting things and it's not the people, like they're actually stealing the ballot box itself. And you see people fighting in the background and lager and beers. And that's where the election would take place. So they're stealing the election. And this is a pipe. That's what that is. So they're saying that the Irish and the Germans are stealing elections, that they're drunken people and violent. Um, that's the takeaway for um, people who might look at this cartoon and, and worry about democracy being um, questioned. So, you know, immigration patterns and democracy 
very much connected in, in people's minds in the period. By the way, I showed you before some of the Germans coming to the United States. They, like I said, they settled further out west. They, for example, here is one of them in Wisconsin, and this is of them in um, further out west in um, Cincinnati. They created little uh, enclaves within the cities that were um, kind of similar immigrant uh, population. So they would have German town, or um, they called it over the Rhine, <laughs> or Little Germany rather. And see all the German signs and things. And think of it like when you go to New York City, it's just one example. I mean, there are pockets of the city that have been named after immigrant communities, like, for example, Chinatown or Little Italy. And as the immigration population patterns have shifted in New York City, you can kind of see that those areas have kind of changed. Like, for example, Little Italy used to be a lot bigger, but Chinatown has kind of engulfed it. And that's partly because of the immigration patterns of the post-60s. On the 70s and 80s, where, where China um, and other places around Asia were opened up and immigration patterns changed. And that got reflected into the um, reduction of Little Italy as one example. So we're going to move off of immigration and now take a look at this uh, invention piece. So what innovations, inventions that are happening in this period and what are their impacts? So looking at this map, um, this is the United States in this period, um, at least up to 1859. And you're going to get a sense of this idea that we'll talk about um, regionalism. So regionalism is this idea that there's going to be different regions of the United States in this period that kind of all work together in a way, but they're interdependent or potentially codependent on one another. So you get um, a region that's making the cotton and then up in here, um, you get dairy and cattle. And then in this area, you're getting corn and that, that, that kind of defined the differences between different parts of the country um, predominantly. And this is tobacco farming happening here in these pockets right there. Um, and you get rice and indigo in the deeper south because it's possible to grow those types of things. And so that kind of defined the differences between different parts of the country. Yeah, we kind of already know that. But the point I want to make here is that they kind of worked with one another. So if the cotton is made here... Um, then you get um, lumber and timber up more into the Northeast. So that helps and benefits the South. So South gives cotton, the North gives them the lumber. Um, the range and the cattle happen more out West. So the Eastern part of the United States relies on the cow and the, the pasture fields in the West and they go travel back and forth. Um, if you wanna get rice, you gotta get it from the, from the South and they get travels up. Um, if you want to get fruit and orchards, that's going to happen more in the Northeast. So they're kind of interdependent on one another. It's the Northeast, South, and West connection that I want you to pay attention to. So mostly North and South, and then East and West are the big differences um, in terms of the way that they kind of regionalize things. And then you get um, these other things that are kind of interesting to take a look at, like iron ore more in like upper New Jersey, in the, north, the far Northeast, and then the silver and gold out into the west. Um, and this area is uh, coal, so that's in Pennsylvania. And then anthracite coal is a little bit grayer. I think actually that's what that is. Um, yeah. So you get a sense of like the like the way that all these societies are kind of connected to. And then this shows you this little dot over here um, over like principal manufacturing cities product value. So if you've got like a circle around the dot, um, you've got over 100 uh, million. And then if you've got um, 10 million, if it's got a dot. So other major cities. So like if you look at the South, there's not really any cities that have um, a lot of industry, industry going on. Um, you do have some like out into the, into like the upper South, let's say. Um, you do get some there. And then when you get real into very uh, industrialized parts of the country, it's more like in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, like this area right here. Um, and then also, I believe, yeah, that's it. So the big industrial places, like the outliers are like in Pennsylvania and New York. And then in here, you get these major industrial cities, um, but only one in the deep, in the deep south uh, in Memphis, um, but the rest of it is, or New Orleans. But other than that, like the, the deep South doesn't have any, like 
real industrial manufacturing. In the upper South, they do. So it's not true to say that there's none, but it's far less and far more concentrated in the North, as you can see all these black dots everywhere. There's just one over here in the West. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is the way that the inventions of this period start to impact people's everyday lives. So here this is um, from the 1860s. So even as late as 1860s, um, you could still get like this kind of apprenticeship. But what I like about this painting is that we can contrast it with that right there. Um, and you get a real difference between the two of them. So if you're like in the 1840s, um, there's more mechanization of the processes of industrialization that won't really happen into a major, major, major degree until after the civil war. But um, it's starting to happen in this period. So in 1860, this is a wheelwright. So this would people, people who'd make the wheels for a wagon. And what we get here is a sort of this hierarchical relationship. Um, there's this person who is the master craftsman uh, off over here onto the left side of the painting. And then you get these people that are apprentices. Looks like he's reading about how to make things. He's actually planing uh, a board, and, but he's directing all of it. And it's kind of like a, you know, an example of you know working together and you're making the product from start to finish. But as things become more mechanized, you get the foreman and factory workers. So in this painting, you really have to be, um, you have to really learn and and have a lot of knowledge about the skill and you're gonna make the product from start to finish. But by the time we get to, um, and I believe this is McCormick Reaper, um, the thing that would actually like pick up and, and thrash the corn, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, you do it with a horse, but it would kind of be like a mechanized tractor in a way. And so this is an example of like just absolute chaos. It's black and white and the experience is more like much more hierarchical. I mean, obviously there's a hierarchy in another one, but like, at least you made the product from start to finish. Here you're just making small little elements of it. So the experience is far different and become almost alienated from the product that you're making. Here's an example of uh, more of that mechanization that happens uh, in, in, uh, in New England in particular. Um, this is a textile mill using the hydropower of the area and the, um, and the, the thing that they have. And then also using that to, um, to, uh, that make textiles and then that becomes more mechanized as well so when samuel slater first built his mill on the blackstone river in 1791 angry neighbors tore down the dam that provided power to its water driven machinery an early instance of grassroots environmental protest this pawtucket uh, rhode island mill began by producing only thread which was then distributed to home weavers who turned it into cloth Within two years, Slater and his partners were selling their product to the far-flung markets in Salem, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. And by 1805, the mill featured the mule, a new machine which made possible the spinning, spinning of finer yarns. So that's what they're making there. And it, basically, in the beginning, it was more like taking cotton bats that you would, um, basically the raw fiber from the plant, and then you made something that was homespun. You would just spin it on your own. Um, and you kind of get a sense of this, like, you know, in terms of the clothing that people had. If you look at closets from the 1820s, 1840s, there's really non-existent. Um, even up into the 1920s, the closets are far smaller. And that's because people don't have a lot of clothes. That's for a couple of reasons. One is that the process of making clothes is very expensive and difficult. And the process of cleaning those clothes is very um, time consuming. So you don't really have a lot of clothes. By the time that mass production really hits for the clothing industries, like in the 70s and 80s, uh, and you, you sort of see the people's closets get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in that period. And that reflect, reflects the manufacturing um, innovations that are happening in that market later on. Um, now clothes are barely, like, almost, like, <laughs> worthless. Uh, you know, if you look at um, a lot of stores, they constantly are changing their stock. So... Um, we're going to take a look in particular at something that really made it possible for uh, for slavery. Now, in, now, not that slavery didn't exist prior, but like slavery didn't really grow until the development of the cotton gin. And basically, it it took a whole field of you know taking um, cotton and picking it and making it you know and 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 processing and getting rid of the seeds from the fiber 
fiber is like the cotton, what you think of cotton, and there's seeds that are kind of all in there. You got to get the, the seeds out. And so it wasn't a viable industry um, to do it on a very large scale because it would be very, very difficult for even if they just had hundreds and thousands of slaves to pick the little tiny seeds out. It was very difficult. But um, once they develop the cotton gin, and all they have to do is run it through this engine, hence the gin, it's kind of a shortening of the word engine, um, this cotton engine or cotton gin um, made it possible for this to be a viable industry and therefore led to the development of expansion of slavery in the period. This is the story of an invention that changed the world. Imagine a machine that could cut 10 hours of work down to one. A machine so efficient that it would free up people to do other things, kind of like the personal computer. But the machine I'm going to tell you about did none of this. In fact, it accomplished just the opposite. In the late 1700s, just as America was getting on its feet as a republic under the new U.S. Constitution, Slavery was a tragic American fact of life. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both became president while owning slaves, knowing that this peculiar institution contradicted the ideals and principles for which they fought a revolution. But both men believed that slavery was going to die out as the 19th century dawned. They were, of course, tragically mistaken. The reason was an invention a machine they probably told you about in elementary school, Mr. Eli Whitney's cotton gin. A Yale graduate, 28-year-old Whitney had come to South Carolina to work as a tutor in 1793. Supposedly, he was told by some local planters about the difficulty of cleaning cotton. Separating the seeds from the cotton lint was tedious and time-consuming. Working by hand, a slave could clean about a pound of cotton a day. But the Industrial Revolution was underway, and the demand was increasing. Large mills in Great Britain and New England were hungry for cotton to mass-produce cloth. As the story was told, Whitney had a eureka moment and invented the gin short for engine. The truth is that the cotton gin already existed for centuries in small but inefficient forms. In 1794, Whitney simply improved upon the existing gins and then patented his invention, a small machine that employed a set of combs that could separate seeds from lint mechanically as a crank was turned. With it, a single worker could eventually clean from 300 to 1,000 pounds of cotton a day. In 1790, about 3,000 bales of cotton were produced in America each year. A bale was equal to about 500 pounds. By 1801, with the spread of the cotton gin, cotton production grew to 100,000 bales a year. After the disruptions of the War of 1812, production reached 400,000 bales a year. As America was expanding through the land acquired in the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, yearly production exploded to 4 million bales. Cotton was king. It exceeded the value of all other American products combined, about three-fifths of America's economic output. But instead of reducing the need for labor, the cotton gin propelled it, as more slaves were needed to plant and harvest king cotton. The cotton gin and the demand of northern and English factories recharted the course of American slavery. In 1790, America's first official census counted nearly 700,000 slaves. By 1810, two years after the slave trade was banned in America, the number had shot up to more than one million. During the next 50 years, that number exploded to nearly four million slaves in 1860, the eve of the Civil War. As for Whitney, he suffered the fate of many an inventor. Despite his patent, other planters easily built copies of his machine or made improvements of their own. You might say his design was pirated. Whitney made very little money from the device that transformed America. But to the bigger picture and the larger questions, 
what should we make of the cotton gin? History has proven that inventions can be double-edged swords. They often carry unintended consequences. The factories of the Industrial Revolution spurred innovation and an economic boom in America. But they also depended on child labor and led to tragedies like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that killed more than 100 women in 1911. Disposable diapers made life easy for parents, but they killed off diaper delivery services. And do we want landfills overwhelmed by dirty diapers? And of course, Einstein's extraordinary equation opened a world of possibilities. But what if one of them is Hiroshima? So this is what uh, life would be like in one of those New England factories that was making that cotton, which ironically is this labor-saving device that actually propels more use of slaves because it just wasn't a viable industry prior. But then all of a sudden it was possible. This is what it was like for people who were processing that cotton in New England. Remember I talked about this idea that the, the different sections of the country depended on one another in a lot of ways. And here's an example of that. I mean, you obviously are going to make... Um, cotton, you're going to need to use the cotton from the South. So the, the North and the South interacted in that way. So 1936, um, New England girl working in a factory, or rather a uh, publisher of a newspaper looking at New England factories. The operatives work 13 hours a day in the summertime and from daylight to dark into the winter. At half past four in the morning, the factory bell rings and at five, the girls must be in the mills. So fatigued, are numbers of girls that they go to bed soon after receiving their evening meal and endeavor by comparatively long sleep to resuscitate their weakened frames for the toil to the, of the coming day. So girls actually worked in this particular mill, in the Lowell Mills in New England. And this is interesting little development. Uh, two things that are happening, of course, the development of dogger type, which is a type of photography, and also the ability to print onto cotton. This is called uh, calico. It's a, it's a really cheap kind of cotton. And then you can find a way to print on it. And when they first did that, they kind of made very fanciful patterns. And that's why um, a lot of the patterns of this period are um, as they are, because they're just showing off the ability they had to do that. And what that does is it starts to vastly expand women's wardrobe because they had more fabric. But don't think that they're going to stores to buy clothes um, in the traditional sense. Sometimes, most of the time, I think they're probably making their own clothes. So they had this ability of this new fabric that they could make. Um, the other example of, um, of the development of uh, innovation that's happening in this period is the development of uh, interchangeable parts. The idea behind interchangeable parts is that instead of making a part particularly for that particular gun, for example, you make that part so that it can be used in any gun that you make in the factory. And you have handles that could be interchangeable. And by doing that, you've made it so that you can start to get really good at making that screw, get really good at making that handle, uh, and then everything can kind of work with one another. doesn't mean it worked right away. They're just starting to get into this idea of being able to do that. Um, and so that happens with, um, uh, with interchangeable parts. That's the important thing there. There's also labor unrest that's happening in a lot of these factories, and this won't really um, be able to come to a full front until um, until after the Civil War. But it's starting. It's not like labor movement isn't happening in this period. It's just far less strong, uh, and they have some more. Um, I don't know if call accomplishments in the 1880s, 1890s or so, but it does become more prominent in that period. In a lot of ways, they aren't very successful in the 1890s and 18, 1880s, 1890s. You'll take a look at that after when we get to it. Um, so violence broke out along the New York waterfront in 1836 when laborers striking for higher wages attacked scabs. The scab is a person who crosses the picket line um, and goes into work, even though people are, people are striking at that moment. Here's what uh, Philip Hone says in his diary. So that's private. So we'll talk a lot about the way in which you can take a look at documents. Um, but this is something that he's saying to himself in his diary with an audience of almost no one. So you speak very differently than you would if you were writing a letter to your wife, or if you were writing a letter to the editor, or if you were the president of the United States issuing a proclamation that everyone would read. This was something that he wrote in his private diary. 
assumably with an audience of just himself. The mayor, who acts with vigor and firmness, ordered out the troops who are now on duty with loaded arms. These measures have restored order for the present, but I fear the elements of disorder are at work. The bands of Irish and foreigners instigated by the mischievous councils of the trade union and other combinations of discontented men, basically just other organizations, are acquiring strength and importance, which will ere long be difficult to quell. So he's really concerned about the violence that's going on. And he kind of puts it in the hands of the Irish uh, and other foreigners that are there. I don't know if he's necessarily a know-nothing uh, member, but he definitely has nativist points of view in there. This is a sewing skirt factory. Um, obviously, <laughs> the outfits that they're wearing are going to make it so they are very much distant from one another um, and kind of hampers their ability to work necessarily as well, but also maintains their cult of domesticity. Um, this idea that a woman um, has certain things that she can do and certain things that she can't do. Um, so this maintains, even though they're going into the workforce, they're also still maintaining their, their femininity. This is the sewing floor of the Thompson Skirt Factory in 1859, so just before the Civil War. Uh, and what it really does is it shows you that, like, as it says here, the transition from hand sewing um, a lot of times they have these like sewing circles where women get together and, and have companionship and ways to talk to one another, but also sew at the same time. Um, this makes it more impersonal and you would just be able to buy your skirt with, you know, on the rack somewhere. And then most of the background, it says strive to excel. This is, so this is a workplace in 1859. This is a woman uh, from her own experience, not a newspaper person looking at it, but like from her own experience of what it was like to work in one of these mills. You wish to know minutely of our hours of labor. We go to the mill at five o'clock. At seven, we come out to breakfast. At half past seven, we return to our work and stay until half past 12. At one or quarter past one, four months in the year, we return to our work and stay until seven at night. Then the evening is all our own, which is more than some laboring girls can say who think nothing is more tedious than factory life. So they're working like really long hours. So one of the things that we're gonna start to pay attention to is um, what are happening to the average working hours uh, in the 1840s as we go into the 1890s, 1900s, 1920s, and even today, where are those hours at? Um, and are there, and there's no minimum wage at this point. There's no workman's compensation. There's no protections for any kind of worker. There's no childcare, um, there's no excuse me, child labor laws, like all that's not around. So they can work you for as long as they want with no breaks because there's no um, legislation that would that would uh, make that possible. And again, this is the McCormick Reaper. I, I kind of showed this image before. And I just want to show you, this is a, a the, the Reaper obviously had great impact on industrial revolution reaching into farms. Uh, and this is uh, um, one that was um, used in 1831 um, and McCormick had a, uh, a factory in Chicago that was cranking these out, or more than 20,000 reapers uh, a year. And they were powered, basically a modern day, what would, the modern day version of this would be a tractor. But industrialization comes to the farm as well with this. So here's one from eight 174 year old reaper that still technically works with two horsepower. <laughs> So cool. Okay, so the other thing we want to take a look at when we look at immigration is where are they going? Where are people in the United States? Um, so what we're seeing here in the United States is an overall trend that we'll see, which is that the United States is moving further out west in like almost for all of American history. The mean center of the United States is moving further and further out west. So cities like Cincinnati, which were a town of 2,500 people in 1800, by 1860 are 161,000 people. And 45% of those people living there are foreign born. So it's a, just a great anecdotal example of the overall demographic shift that's taking place. But so every 10 years, there's a census done. And one of the things they find out is where people are living. And these little triangles represent the mean center of the United States. 
So it moves further and further out west over time, and then slowly starts to move further and further south. Um, so we'll talk about why that actually happened. Obviously, this population center is continuing to go in this direction, and it does move further and further south. People, More people are living south than before. Why is that? Um, why move west and why go south? And why does it only happen after World War II, basically? It's technically just before World War II. If you were to take a big, flat, rigid map of the United States and rest it on something sharp and pointy, and if every person in the United States weighed the same, the mean center of population is exactly where that map would balance. The census comes out with this figure every 10 years. It seems meaningless on its surface, but really that one little point carries in it a lot of information about how our population is moving. The first mean center of population was in Kent County, Maryland. In the 1800s, when the U.S. was adding on states all the time and people were moving out west all the time, the center sped west. A big influx of European immigrants to the northeast, plus movement of southern blacks to the north in the early 1900s, put on the brakes. Tacking on Alaska and Hawaii later in the century, it started to pull it out west a bit more, but, but also it started to move south a bit, particularly in recent years. Part of that is because of a booming Latino population in the southeast and in Texas, and part of that is economic factors like the growth of the Texas oil industry. One other thing, air conditioning. The growth of air conditioning, some experts say, has made the south more livable. Today, the mean center is just near Plato, Missouri, which in 2010 had just 109 people. So though that's the center of population, it's not at all a population center. No one really lives there. But it just geographically says that there's this shift towards the west. And then the transportation revolution that's happening in this period is an important one to take a look at. It starts off with the development of these roads, um, which are represented by these lines here. Um, and basically you're seeing it, it's facilitating a more of an east-west connection same here as well um in the midwest all the way out to the to the far west um we're getting a lot of this east-west connection and um obviously people are going on horseback ride um the development of the canals as well is happening in this period and the steamships by mid 19th century steamboats had actually been able to traverse the um the the canal system that was set up on the mississippi river that's one of the main through lines of the united states going north and south but here's another example of more of like an east west connection um up here in the erie canal and then this is all the canals by 1840 um obviously more in the northeast and and pretty much exclusively in the northeast and facilitating this east west connection so northeast to west has a lot of connection with one another but the South seems to be kind of left out of this canal system. Uh, here are railroads, and I think it tells a very similar story. More of the connections are going east-west, and there's far more concentration of railroad lines uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the north. So they're kind of being left out of this, um, less of a need for it. The other thing that's taking place is that um, like the factory is kind of... Um, making time more consistent. And one example of that you can see is that the girls that entered the factory had a, a bell that went off. So being on time was extremely important. Uh, and the other thing that makes uh, time become more consistent is because of the railroad industry. So previously you got local time and that might've been you know five minutes off from town to town to town to account for the rise and the sunset. Um, but eventually over time, there's more standardization of this because of the railroad timetables needed to be accurate so that you knew when the train was going to come. You couldn't really have local time anymore, or you had to like break down time more programmatically. So that's why um, time kind of becomes shifted as a result of this as well. All right, so overall trends we're looking at, right? All the way from the beginning. Think about immigration. How does immigration affect the United States? What effect does industrialization have? What effect do the new technologies have? And to what extent did transportation innovation lead to national unity in the period? Um, I want you to think about those questions.